Today's video will be building a right back enhanced 46 DX2 PC. So today's video we are going to be building a new 46 for myself um, and there's a multitude of reasons for that. Uh, keep in mind I do uh, very often shoot my videos out of order so uh, you see the machine here and it's pretty much ready to go and complete but through this video uh, we're going to kind of go through the process of me putting this PC together and we're going to look at all the parts of it. So. Uh, you might be thinking at right back enhanced, how is that any different from just a regular DX2? And it, it is very similar. Um, right back enhanced, it's just a certain way that, like, again, I'm, I'm a hobbyist. This isn't like a technical channel. So all I know is it's just like a different way that the cache and the memory uh, runs. And it usually it's a little bit faster than regular, uh, how they usually do, which is called right through. Um, so this machine is right back. There are some, a few downsides. I know it has some incompatibilities with certain SCSI cards and things like that. It can be slightly more temperamental, um, but like I said, it is a little bit faster. Uh, generally, uh, chips that support it right back were like the DX4 and up. Uh, but there were, at least with Intel, there was one model of the 66 megahertz DX2 that did use uh, right back cache. And that is kind of what this guy is based around. Um, but there was another reason I wanted to do this. So this guy right here, you may have seen it in the background a lot of my videos. I did a video on it a long time ago called Anatomy of a 46. And this has been like my main uh, 46. It's a DX2, 66 megahertz, just standard right through. And I put this PC together way before I started this channel, like 20 years ago. Um, this isn't like an original build of mine from like the early 90s or anything like that. I think it was like the early uh, mid 2000s that I put this thing together. So about, about 20 years, give or take. Um, and it has served me very well, but it has some, some issues. Um, I like the case, it's really cool. Uh, of course, it's missing a megahertz display, which is a horrible downside. You're pathetic. No right back cache and no LED for your megahertz display? Pathetic! And this machine has served me well, but uh, I don't, there's just some things I don't like about it. Uh, mainly the, the motherboard. I, when I built this machine, I didn't know a whole lot about retro computing. Uh, I was just kind of getting back into it. And the motherboard in there is okay, uh, but it's kind of like just what I had sitting around. Um, it's a UMC is the chipset on the board. It's decent. It has some cool features. Like it has IO, like IDE built into the motherboard, which is kind of rare for 46 boards. I, I don't see that very often on like socket three boards uh, with the IDE built in, but it's a, it's a little bit limited. It's a little bit slow. Um, memory and cache amounts that you can put in there are limited. Uh, like it's like 32 megabytes of RAM and 256 uh, K of L2 cache, and that's that's actually fairly ideal. That that's actually fine. Um, but I, I always just kind of wanted the option to go bigger if I wanted to, and that board never gave me the option. Um, and like I said, it's been pretty reliable. It served me pretty well, but I've, I've had a few issues with it. Um, another downside with it is it doesn't use like a coin uh, CMOS battery on board. You have to use like an, an extra, it used a barrel battery, which was removed. And um, I've been using like an external uh, CMOS battery. And I know I could like try to solder in a socket and, or something like that. Um, and, you know, some kind of adapter to use a coin battery. But so I was really looking to build a machine just with a different motherboard. I really wanted to start over fresh building a, a 46 for myself uh, with some of the acquired knowledge that I, I've acquired over the years and I wanted to change things up a little bit. And that just kind of led me to thinking why not do uh, just like redo and make a whole other 46 for yourself, uh, find a, a case maybe you like a little better. I, now don't get me wrong, I like that case we just looked at where my old 46. Um, you know, it has a lot of bays in it. It has twice as, well, not twice as many. It has like an extra um, five and a quarter inch. It has two of these three and a half inch bays. 
it, it's a nice case. Um, it lacks the, the LED display, which is a bummer, but I don't know. I just, I like this case a little bit more, even though it's slightly more limited. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to start over and build another 46. Uh, and I wanted to mix it up a little bit, so I really wanted to do something with, like, right back. So uh, join me for this video. We're going to uh, go through the process of putting this guy together, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So here is the motherboard I'm going with for this project. Um, now this is an M912 motherboard. I believe it also goes by a couple other names like Amptron, uh, just a couple other names. Now I don't know if this is like the highest end board or a, a very high end uh, socket 3 board. Um, I'm using it because it's what I have and it supports pretty much all the features I am looking for. Uh, but then again, I, I don't know if this is considered one of the faster boards out there. Um, I don't think it is, but like I said, it, it seems to uh, be supporting all the features I'm looking for right now, and it seems like a pretty decent board. Um, I do know there are some versions of out there uh, of this board that do have the infamous fake L2 cache. Um, I believe some versions, this cache is like blank and it says like right back on it and uh, they're soldered onto the motherboard. Sort of similar to the M919 board, uh, but there are also versions like this one where there are actually sockets and the L2 cache works perfectly fine, so uh, keep that in mind. I actually have another one of these boards that's a slightly different version. Uh, it might be from a different uh, manufacturer, <laughs> but I think the only difference is the ISA slots are white. Um, I would have went with that board, uh, but unfortunately with that board, one of the RAM, I guess, uh, sockets, the, the holders broke. So I just went with this one here. Um, so this does use a uh, UMC chipset. Uh, it supports front side buses anywhere from, I believe, uh, 25 to 50 megahertz. Um, right here there's a little silk screen chart of all the CPUs it supports. It does support the later uh, higher end 486s. I believe it even supports the Cyrix 5X86. Um, so it supports everything I'm looking for, uh, for here uh, CPU wise. It even supports like UMC CPUs and things like that. Um, it does support uh, right back cache and it does support the uh, P24D uh, CPUs. Um, so we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 16-bit ISA slots, and 3 32-bit uh, VLB slots, which is very nice. And one big thing I almost completely forgot to mention is this L2 cache, the amount uh, you're allowed to go to. Now, right now I have the standard 256K of L2 cache, but this board can take a whopping 1 megabyte, so a full 1 megabyte uh, can also take 512 uh, K of L2 cache. But yeah, um, I, I would like to max this out to a full one megabyte, although the benefit it would give me is uh, dubious. Uh, usually you have extremely diminishing returns after 256. So uh, a megabyte or even 512K, uh, I, I don't know how much of a, of a boost, if any, um, that would give me. And depending on the amount of RAM, I've even heard sometimes it can decrease performance, but I don't know, there's something kind of cool about having uh, a megabyte of L2 cache in a uh, Socket 3 uh, motherboard build. Um, two different types of RAM that you can have here. There's 30 pin and 72 pin. This board supports up to 64 megabytes of memory, so all of the RAM you would want for a Socket 3 setup. Um, right now I am using the two uh, 72 pin uh, RAM sl uh, sockets or slots uh, for a total of uh, 64 megabytes of RAM. These are both 32 megabyte uh, sticks of FPM RAM. Uh, this board does not support EDO. That's okay. Not a big deal in my opinion. Uh, another nice bonus is it uses a little coin cell battery. It doesn't use uh, like an like I believe there's a, a connection here somewhere for if you wanted to use an external battery, but um, I do like that you can use a standard kind of like coin cell battery. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Standard AT power, um, standard AT keyboard connector here. So yeah, overall it's just a nice board. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's, you know, a super speed demon, but um, it does seem pretty nice. So we'll see. Hopefully I'll set this guy up and we really won't have any issues. But 
uh, we will see. So here is the CPU I'll be going with uh, for this build. Uh, it is a P24D uh, Intel i. 486DX2, 66 megahertz. So um, this is pretty much, for the most part, with one exception, a standard Intel 46DX2, 66 megahertz. I'm going with the 66 megahertz just because I think it's the ideal 46 uh, if you're building a 46 build. I mean, this CPU is just the king of uh, CPUs during that golden age of DOS. Um, it's it's like it's not really too fast. It's not too slow. It's just it's just the iconic 46, at least in my opinion. And this CPU is going to be powerful enough to play a lot of those golden age uh, DOS titles. Of course, there are faster ones. Um, you can get, you know, 133 megahertz AMD 5x86. You can even get 100 megahertz uh, Intel if you want an Intel 46. There's slower ones, of course, but I just think the 66 megahertz uh, just hits the sweet spot uh, for that era. Uh, just an iconic CPU. Um, now, this one is slightly different uh, from other uh, 46 uh, DX266s. I said this is a D revision, uh, the P24D. Um, so that just means this is actually capable of using a uh, write back cache. So the cache inside this CPU, um, on the regular DX2, it's write through, and on this guy, it is write back. So sometimes these are also known as like enhanced uh, DX2s. Um, so right here, if you look here, it's an SX955. Uh, I believe this is the only um, DX2 they made that was enhanced with write back cache the SX955. Um, so uh, you do need a motherboard that supports that feature uh, right back cache uh, internally in the CPU. Um, as for what that does exactly, it just makes it run a little bit faster than your average uh, DX2. So I, I've seen different estimates, but depending on software and motherboard, uh, this usually will run 1% to 5% faster. Uh, again, I think that's mostly dependent on uh, you know the software you're running. I, I've also heard figures as high as 10%, but I don't know about that. I, yeah, I, like I said, I guess you could go with a faster CPU, but I didn't want something like too fast. 1 to 5%, you know, that's not too fast in my opinion. This is, this is just like a 66 MHz DX2 with a little bit, of, little bit of spice, a little bit of an extra kick to it. It's a little bit different and a little bit interesting. Um, now, one thing I have read, it, it might be a little more difficult to get running stably than, you know, your standard DX2 with write through cache. Maybe a little bit. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, I do know write back uh, seems to have some problems with SCSI uh, cards. Uh, I know certain systems, uh, if you're running write back cache, it might conflict with your SCSI card. Uh, I'm not using SCSI in this system, so that shouldn't be a problem. So uh, hopefully this will run just nice and stable, uh, just like a regular uh, 46 DX2 at 66 megahertz. So we will find out. This is the case I'll be using uh, with my uh, 46 enhanced uh, build. Of course, it is a desktop case. I do love desktop uh, cases. Uh, looks like it was Roadrunner Personal Computers. Uh, no idea who that is, uh, if they were large or small or a local uh, kind of deal. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty standard desktop case. Um, of course, there's some yellowing. It's not super bad. I've seen much worse. Um, there's a little section here. It looks like there must have been a badge or a sticker there. Uh, of course, I, I'm probably might uh, I'm probably going to put on a badge or two of some sort. Um, I just have not uh, as of filming the section, but um, yeah, it's a pretty nice case. Uh, it's not the most I guess efficient uh, case uh, design in a way that, and I only say that because I do have one. Uh, my other 46, uh, the previous case I used, it was actually ever so slightly smaller than this one and it actually had three uh, five and a quarter inch bays and two of the three and a half inch bays uh, plus internal bays so uh, this one seems to be with more space it actually has less bays we only have uh, two five and a quarter inch and one three and a half inch bay right here although there are two internal bays for a hard drive 
Uh, of course, just basic setup here, nothing super fancy. Uh, just got a 1.44 megabyte floppy drive and the 1.2 megabyte uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drive. And then we have our optical drive right here. And um, that's actually a DVD drive. So this drive here is actually a DVD drive. I specifically picked this drive here because it doesn't have a lot of like the fanciness to it. It, it looks like a more classic optical drive. It doesn't really look too much like a, like a DVD drive. Um, now it did say right here, DVD, and I've kind of sanded that off. It doesn't look perfect because of like the yellowing and it's a lighter shade here, but it does look uh, better uh, than, you know, when it's had DVD. Um, so the reason I did go with a DVD drive uh, rather than just a CD drive is just because uh, CDRs. Um, I do run a lot of CDRs. Uh, sometimes, you know, if I'm going to be using a game a lot, uh, I will... Uh, you know, I don't want to keep opening the box over and over, um, so I will sometimes burn a copy of that CD, um, and then I'll put the box copy away, and then I'll just use the, the CDR, or the CDRW. And these DVD drives, other than being more modern usually, um, they usually handle like CDRs uh, much better. Um, also, when I moved out west from the East Coast, um, I couldn't bring a lot. Uh, I only came out here in a small car. Uh, so a lot of my games, like my Wizardry Collection and Ultima Collection, I actually burned them to a CD before I moved out west. So uh, I still have a lot of those that I use. So I wanted a drive that was, uh, you know, reliable for CDRs and stuff. And usually, as I said, DVD drives usually seem to be able to read those better uh, than some of the CD drives. But uh, the downside is when you do put a DVD drive in a classic system, it usually works just fine. I've never had a problem with the, with the you know, like DOS not detecting it. Uh, but the problem is just the look. It aesthetically uh, usually does, doesn't look the part. Because, um, you know, the, usually they'll be labeled like real big DVD. So, but real simple solution, just sanded it off. Yeah, it kind of looks the part now. Um, other than that, we have the little lock right here. Uh, we have a big old power button, and uh, then we have a turbo and reset button. And, of course, the most important feature of this case, and the reason, the thing that elevates this case uh, above my other uh, 46 case that may have a little bit better layout is, of course, it has a LED display, so we can display the speed of the CPU. Very essential for a 46, and I would say all classic uh, computers. <laughs> um, so as of right now, uh, most of this is working. The power light works, the LED display works, the HDD uh, light works, um, of course the power button works, but um, I might show you guys behind this faceplate, uh, it's kind of a mess back there. Um, that's how it was when I got it. The turbo button does not work. Uh, I just can't figure the thing out. Uh, no matter how I try to connect it up, I just can't get it to work or do anything. Uh, the reset button currently also does not work, because, but that reason is obvious, is um, it, it disconnected. So behind this button, um, the two wires that were like soldered onto it broke off. I haven't attempted to fix that yet. Um, I might in the future, though it's not a really high priority because you've always got Control-Alt-Delete, which does the job uh, you know, just as well, I suppose. Um, so it's not a priority, but I would eventually like to get the reset button working. I'm not too concerned about the turbo button, and that's simply because I just never use it. If I want to play a game on a slower PC, I just pull out one of my slower PCs. So uh, turbo button's also not a priority for me. And a special thanks to Geekenspiel for this custom badge here. Uh, I think it looks really nice. 46DX2 right back enhanced. These chips are sort of like really niche, at least the 66 megahertz one. So to do a, a custom badge uh, for this case is really cool. Um, I was going to put it, I mean, it's they're supposed to go here, but I, I didn't want to remove the cool Roadrunner personal computer, so I put it next to it. I think it looks good there. Um, there's a little discoloration. I, the previous owner must have had another like rectangle badge of some sort or sticker right here, but um, I think this looks really good. I really like it. So the first thing we're going to look at here is our uh, I.O. controller. Um, so right here, nothing too fancy, but I do have a VLB controller from uh, CMD Technology. 
Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure of the exact uh, model here, but it has our uh, floppy drive controller and a secondary and primary uh, IDE controller. A lot of different jumpers here. We have a wind bond chip there, standard serial and parallel port. Uh, a little bit of a variation for me. Uh, this this took a little bit of thought, but usually I like to just hook up uh, sort of traditional spinning disk hard drives. I'm gonna do a little bit something a little bit different with this build, and I am using a uh, one gigabyte compact flash card. Um, I hear these Western Digital Silicon Drive ones are pretty reliable, and um, they're pretty good for this sort of you know acting as hard drives. Uh, I'm just gonna be installing DOS 6.22 nothing else so it should hold up it, it should be okay uh, I, I know people have been using these drives in, in retro machines for a while now and even SD cards now but I don't know I've always kind of clung to using just traditional uh, spinning disk hard drives so I'm gonna try this out see how well it works I'm also considering maybe picking up one of those hard drive clackers uh, that I can connect here and it will make a clicking noise when the hard drive is being accessed. I know they don't sound, uh, you know, like a anything like a hard drive, <laughs> a real hard drive running, but it does give some kind of indication. Um, so I don't know. I might grab one of those. They seem pretty cheap and see how that works with it. But um, yeah, this is our hard drive, floppy drive, I.O. controller card that I'm going with here. So onto our video card. Now I had a lot of options for higher end VLB video cards. I have an Arc Logic card. Um, I have another Diamond Monster card. I forget what chip that's based off of, but it has. I think it's based off a of Vision uh, chip, and it has a whole four megabytes of memory. I'm probably going to show off that card in a different video, but I, I just went with the good old trusty uh, Zeng Labs uh, ET4000, largely seen as one of the most compatible and fastest VLP video cards, and an excellent match for any sort of 486 system. Uh, this was cannibalized from my other, my old uh, 486 to put in this machine. I've upgraded it to the full 2 megabytes of RAM. I've never had any issues with this card. It, it, it's always been, you know, very, it's a very fast card. So I just wanted to go with what works for this build. Um, so the ET4000 fits the bill. These are pretty pricey these days. Um, and I know there's some variations and some are faster. This is the, let's look at the chip here. Uh, this is the W32P, the ET4000 W32P. I think there might be a faster variation that does something with memory interlacing. I'm not 100% sure without looking it up, but this is a still a very reliable, fast, and compatible card. Uh, and it will play all your DOS titles uh, just fine. Obviously no 3D acceleration, it's a 2D card, but uh, still a very fast card. Um, I'll probably do another video in the future where I take a look at some of those other uh, really fast VLB cards I have, but as I said, I wanted to go with what works for this build since I'll be using it a lot um, in the future. Uh, so yeah, this is the video card we're going with. This should be perfect for this build. Now to look at the sound uh, side of this build. Uh, this is another card I've cannibalized from my older uh, 486 to put in this one. And this is a Roland uh, MIDI interface card uh, from Roland. And this is a MIDI compatible card. This supports, you know, the uh, intelligent mode uh, if you're using an MT32. Uh, basically, there's a little breakout box, which I have. Connect it here, and then that connects to your MIDI module that connects to your PC. And this takes care of all your um, MIDI. Uh, so you don't have to worry about hanging MIDI bugs, and you don't have to worry about special cables or uh, running it out of your sound card and connecting it that way. Um, this is the official Roland uh, MIDI card. So, yeah, like I said, I'm bring, pulling this over from my older 46 to this build. Uh, this is gonna, what I'm going to use to interface with all my MIDI modules, MT32, uh, SC55, things like that. Um, so this should do a very, very good job. All right, for, for our main sound card, nothing too incredibly fancy here. My goal is just get something that's widely supported and reliable. Um, so this is my first choice. This is a Sound Blaster Pro 2, so it's fully Sound Blaster compatible. 
older DOS titles uh, tend to sound good or best on this card. Um, and uh, this one's a little beat up. There's some bent pins I'm going to have to take a look at. Uh, for whatever reason, I actually have several of these cards. Um, so if this one doesn't work, I have three other ones I can that are on hand that I can try. It's just it's just been my luck that I've come across these things. Um, so these are generally uh, very good cards for DOS. Uh, they do you can't run uh, like they're not uh, compatible uh, with uh, MIDI boxes, so you can't connect these to uh, like an MT32 or a general MIDI box or anything like that. But that's okay because uh, we have the Roland MIDI card, so that's not an issue. Um, genuine Yamaha OPL3 chip on here. Uh, excellent card for DOS, and games sound really good on this card. All right, so there is our uh, DX2 enhanced CPU in there. Um, now, I am going to put on a little heat sink and fan um, on this guy. It doesn't create a tremendous amount of heat. Um, I have opened up machines with 46s that have been running for years and still being reliable that just have had bare 46s. Uh, no heat sink, no fan, nothing. And they still worked. So you can do it. I don't recommend it. So I'm going to uh, slap this guy on there and uh, continue with our build. I do find I do find this a little concerning putting the cards in it in the back and the rear here this fits perfectly fine perfectly flush but as we go on it's not quite snuggly all the way in now it should be fine I still think it's making decent contact and I have put had these cards in here and powered them up and they do work but um, I don't like when it's not all flush and it's not just the video card it's a lot of these cards all the way down just don't seem to sit perfectly. I've had that happen with other boards. Uh, it looks like everything seems to be fine. I don't know what it is, why that happens. Uh, maybe it's the cards, not the board. Or who knows? Um, but hopefully that won't cause any problems. It, do, it does seem like it's still making good enough contact, but uh, we'll see. Okay, everything's installed. MIDI card, I.O., uh, hard drive, floppy drive, controller card, video card, and then right now I have the, here it is, the Sound Blaster um, Pro 2.0, Sound Blaster Video I.O. MIDI card, uh, we're running with that compact flash. If I did want to put in a physical drive though, there's more than enough uh, space here. There's also space on this case right here for a, a hard drive, so I'm not hurting for space or anything like that. Um, Alright, so let's fire it up. So something I want to talk about here is I want to talk about the memory and the cache for this build. Um, because as you're watching this video, you, you may see the chips and amounts changing. I'm not necessarily filming this in order, um, so that may happen. Um, but this is what I want to do with cache. Right now, uh, I have a very safe and standard amount of cache uh, and everything set up. So we have 256K of L2 cache and 32 megabytes of uh, fast page memory. Very standard. 256K of L2 cache is kind of considered the best bang for your buck and the like gold standard for a 486 system. Um, 32 megabytes is about the highest... I mean, you're not really going to run into any DOS games from the early 90s that are going to need more than that. Most of them probably won't even need close to 32 megabytes. Um, and you might even get, if you go with something higher, like 64, you might even have some games freak out on you with because there's too much memory. It's rare, but I think I've had it happen to me once or twice with certain games. Um, so this configuration right here is, is pretty ideal. Um, so 256K of L2 cache, I believe, will cache uh, 64 megabytes of RAM. Now, because the system is in write-back mode, that is halved. So 256K will cache 32 megabytes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's how it works. So this is, this is perfect. This L2 cache should be able to fully cache uh, this memory. This board, though, is capable of quite a bit more. This board is capable of taking a full 1 megabyte of um, L2 cache and 64 megabytes of RAM. Now I couldn't max everything out. It might hurt me a little bit compatibility wise, but I'm just, I don't know. It would kind of feel 
cool. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it will hurt me too much um, compatibility wise. And I am curious about the speed. Now, a full one megabyte in right back mode, I think would still cache a whole 128 megabytes of RAM. So uh, it should still be able to cache the whole thing. I have heard that like if you uh, it might actually slow down performance because I don't have enough memory. It's I, I, I don't know. There's some weird things about L2 cache, so I am curious. Now, right now, this machine system in general is having some weird uh, L2 cache issues, as in when I run programs like uh, Cache Check, it is not detecting the L2 cache. And this really worried me at first because this board, earlier revisions of it, are known to have fake uh, L2 cache, and I was like, oh... But then, like, why would they go through the trouble of putting sockets on here, and then they're not connected to anything? And uh, doing some more research, yeah, if there's sockets on the board, they, they should be real L2 cache. Um, so I was a little worried at first, but I've actually compared speeds with my uh, regular uh, 66 megahertz 46 that has also has 256k of L2 cache. And this machine clocks a little bit faster uh, with the same benchmarks, which which makes sense, because if we're running uh, in right back mode on this machine, it should be a, a little bit faster, and that seems to be checking out uh, with the benchmarks and what I'm looking at uh, compared to the other machine. So I think it, it is running, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, that speed difference, that could also be attributed to uh, chipset. The other, my other 46 uh, has a different chipset, so I don't know 100% um, but I am going to investigate a little bit more. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to run some standard benchmarks with this setup as it is now. Um, I'll also illustrate what's going on with something like cache check. Uh, and I'll show you that. And then I'll remove the cache, we'll run some benchmarks again, same ones. And then I'll put in, uh, hopefully, successfully, the whole one megabyte of uh, L2 cache. And then I'll put in 64 megabytes of RAM. And then we'll see... Uh, how that works and if there's any speed difference if it actually makes it faster or if it makes it a little bit slower so it'll be interesting to compare uh, all of those and see <laughs> all right so here's the situation as promised with the the face plate here that i have removed and as you can see it's it's kind of a mess back there the reset switch unfortunately the problem is uh let me see let me get some light oops let me get some light here um unfortunately where the cable connects to the reset button uh, broke off so you can see the little two little soldered things there um, so to get that to work um, I guess I'd have to solder uh, the two wires back on the reset switch and unfortunately like it, it, it's probably well I know it's laughably easy but I'm like terrible with soldering um, so I don't know maybe I will give it a shot tomorrow Again, I could just use the old Control-Alt-Delete button key combo to reset, so it's not a big deal, but it would be nice to get the reset button working. Um, but other than that, everything else seems to work fine. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the situation. Alright, and it looks like I used my very poor soldering skills to actually fix the reset button, which is kind of a big plus. Again, not absolutely necessary but um, I just hit that and it resets I think hopefully it will come back come back okay excellent looks like the reset button is working again uh, at least for now So the first thing I want to do here is just install the drivers for the Sound Blaster Pro 2. Uh, this isn't necessary. The card will work most of the time, which is putting the command line in the auto exec dot bat. Uh, but this will help with compatibility with some games. Just uh, give me a means to test and make sure the card is working. So I'm just going to install these drivers and uh, 
check test the sound like do sound setup uh, and check a couple games just to make sure uh, the Sound Blaster Pro is working uh, good. So before we look at benchmarks, there's a couple issues that I have to bring up. Uh, first, we have to verify, and using uh, check CPU, we can see that the CPU is running at the correct speed and is running in right back uh, mode. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot get the machine to work in right through mode to compare speeds right through versus right back uh, with this motherboard. Uh, even though there is an option in the BIOS to set things to right through mode, uh, if I do set it to right through mode and I go through and I use something like uh, check CPU, it still uh, says that it is running in right back mode and the benchmarks seem to be the same. So the board just seems to put the chip into right back mode and the cache into right back regardless of how I set it up in the BIOS, which means I can't uh, compare right back and right through speeds on the same board. I can only compare it to another board that's similar but a different chipset in right through mode. Uh, I think maybe this has to do with uh, how I've set up the jumpers. Um, to set the CPU to, you know, the uh, enhanced 486. So I think it's just automatically defaulting to uh, right back mode. Um, not a big deal. And of course, the other issue is I can't confirm the L2 cache is working because cache check just crashes on me. Um, but I can say, as we'll see in a moment, when we look at benchmarks, there is definitely a uh, difference between different amounts of cache and you know if we have no L2 cache and if we do have L2 cache there is a speed difference with the benchmarks um, so the cache is definitely working it's just for whatever cache check and other things like uh, speed sys just do not detect it on this board for whatever reason now if I do boot the machine from DOS from the floppy drive uh, cache check will work but again it just tells me that I have does not seem to have any cache um, at all. Um, if you notice the number, this is when I up after I upgraded to a whole 64 megabytes. I do that later in the video. Um, but yeah, it, it just doesn't detect cache at all, even though the program uh, goes through its paces. But again, uh, the benchmarks definitely detect a difference between uh, the different amounts of cache or cache and no cache at all. And as a final note here, I didn't play with things like memory timings or wait states too much, um, at least this go around. Um, but if I did set the cache read hit uh, wait states to anything other than 3222, um, if I set it to 3111 or 2111, the system would lock up at some point during post. So um, I don't know, I guess maybe if I want to change that, I have to, to use uh, faster L2 cache. I did hear it. It's easier to set better timings with lower amounts of L2 cache, uh, but I found with 256 or the higher amounts I try later, it's still locked up uh, during post at some point. Um, all right, so again, before we get into benchmarks, real quick, this is a, a hobbyist channel. I'm not a technical guy. I am a hobbyist. I do this for fun. So if the numbers seem weird or if I messed up somewhere, uh, you know, kindly uh, let us know what the issue is in the comments. But remember, I'm not a professional. I'm just some guy on the internet. And uh, yeah, that's my lame default uh, disclaimer. All right, let's get to the best part of the video. Let's get to those bar charts. All right, here we go. So first, what we're looking at here, 
Um, on the left, there's the different... I ran the standard benchmarks. Um, the only thing, I did run PCP Bench twice, once with the default and then once with a higher resolution of 640 by 480. Um, so I, uh, we have three different groups or bars of information here. The first one in black, that is my old 486. That's running uh, pretty much the same specs with the same video card, the same uh, VLB uh, ET4000, same amount of RAM, same amount of L2 cache. Uh, it's running a regular DX2, 66 megahertz, but it's running in right through, uh, not right back. Remember, uh, they both use UMC chipsets, but they are different chipsets, and it is different boards. Again, I explained earlier in the video why I couldn't set this board into right through to like directly compare it, so we have to compare it to my old 486 setup. Um, the blue is the four, uh, same specs, 256K of L2 cache in right back mode, and then the yellow is a zero K, that's no uh, cache. And I did this, um, well, at first I ran it by actually going into the BIOS and disabling the L2 cache. And then I also, uh, when I did some changes later, actually this is with the L2 cache physically removed. And I got the same results with uh, both ways. So um, the first thing I gotta say, definitely the um, right back uh, with the 256k of L2 cache is in the lead in all of these. Um, I am a little surprised it's not as much of a difference between zero and the 256k as I thought. I mean, it's like, again, this is just a handful of benchmarks, small amount of benchmarks, uh, but it's really like a one or two FPS difference or one or two point difference in most of these, with the exception of 3D Bench 1.0C, which seems to have the biggest uh, difference in results. I think it's like five or six uh, difference in points there. But the rest, it's like it's a smaller difference than I thought. Um, maybe an act, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense to some of you guys, let me know. It's just not as big a difference as I thought. Um, one thing I do find interesting is um, my right back machine, this this new 46 I'm putting together, um, it's comparable to my old machine even when it doesn't have cash in it. So a cashless, this new machine without cash, um, looking at these benchmarks numbers, is actually comparable to my old machine that had 256k and I don't know what's going on. Maybe my old machine was just really slow, the chipset, or uh, maybe the um, the internal cache in the CPU um, running at right back speeds is, is really like making up the difference there. I, I don't know. Maybe some of you guys can tell me. Does this does this look accurate to you guys or not? Um, I mean, I guess it seems like it does. It does make sense. The the what the the machine we thought would be in the lead isn't the lead, but it does show us that there is definitely the cache is definitely making a difference. So even though a program like Cache Check is like freaking out on me and not detecting cache or crashing, it these numbers do uh, pretty much clearly show that there still is a difference going on when we uh, disable and enable the cache. Um, all right, so um, let's move on. All right, so now we're gonna run Top Bench here, and I'm gonna make some direct comparisons with LGR's wood grain uh, 486. Um, and I'm doing that because, well, it's a good comparison, and also most of you guys are probably familiar with that machine. Um, you know, he's a big retro computer YouTuber, um, so it's a good, we're all familiar with it, uh, more than likely. Now, if I remember, originally without L2 cache, he got a score of like 150, and when he upgraded his machine, to 256k of L2 cache. Um, now his machine, I believe, is running ru uh, right through, not right back. Um, he got 190. So uh, according to this, our machine here is getting 235 uh, for our score, which is uh, kind of impressive. It, it, when I, it's like uh, closely matched PC chips M919. That's like a later PCI board. Um, and it's going to in, an Intel i46 DX4 to 100 megahertz. Obviously, the score for that is a bit higher, but I mean, we're not ridiculously far off. I'm looking at these numbers. I am. I'm kind of impressed here. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's. I think that's a good score for a DX2 at 66 megahertz. So I think now that we have the system running. Uh, stable. I'm going to do an upgrade before we do the benchmarks because I'm really curious about if the numbers will change. So uh, what I want to do here is I'm going to up the RAM. I'm going to double the RAM from 32 to 64 megabytes just because it's cool. 
and I'm going to up the L2 cache. I'm going to max it out to a full one megabyte, and we're going to see. Um, we're going to see if that uh, changes the numbers at all. Okay, so now kind of the nerve-wracking part. Um, so basically, I, right now, I'm going to have to remove all these chips right here. That's the 256K of L2 cache and the tag RAM, which is this guy. So i got to remove all these, and then i got to replace them with uh, these guys here. And uh, these are 128k times 8, and then I have a tag RAM that's 64k times 8 to put here. And this part's always a little nerve-wracking for me because, although it's it's pretty clear, the, I got to move, disconnect, move some of these wires. Um, there's always the chance that I'm going to bend or break pins uh, pulling these chips out. Um, doesn't happen too often, but it could happen. And then I don't really have any backups uh, sitting around so now I'm if that happens I'm out uh, L2 cash on this machine till I can buy replacements uh, so it's always a little nerve-wracking uh, pulling these and then replacing the chips and then if I do put in the one megabyte and then they don't work for whatever reason or they're slower then I gotta pull those and I gotta put these chips back in and then hope everything goes smoothly uh, so hopefully this will be a smooth process I'll just pull these guys and uh, check out the one megabyte and hope everything goes smooth so uh, we'll find out well it looks like we have our full one megabyte of L2 cache installed I haven't tested it yet uh, I'm hoping it works though I also had to you have to reset the jumpers a little bit uh, it's these jumpers and then this jumper here that have to be set a certain way it's a little bit complicated for setting cache um, and uh, that's about the only other thing I, I did notice is, is that all of these cache are rated for 15, and it was like that with my 256K as well. And I believe ideally you want the tag RAM to be like faster than the others, but 15 is pretty fast. I'm not sure they make, um, I know they make, uh, I think they make 12, and I, I've seen 10, but I've, I've heard the 10 weren't, were like, probably counterfeits. They're like fake, slower ones that people uh, change the marking to 10. Um, but they're really not 10, and I don't, I don't know if that's the case with the 12, too, so I don't know. Uh, what do you guys think? Is there faster L2 cache I can, uh, get for this thing? Maybe that's, um, some of my issues, maybe, uh, with the tag RAM needs to be faster. But like I said, I don't know if they make faster than 15. Maybe there's 12, not sure, I'll have to, to check, but, um, okay, so I guess we'll just hook it up now, and then we'll run some benchmarks and hope it all works. And thankfully, and to my surprise, uh, it actually works. And as you can see, I also uh, doubled the RAM to a full 64 megabytes. So we're maxed out for RAM and L2 cache. As you can see right there, full 1 megabyte. Now, I did have an initial issue where it wasn't detecting. It, where it says 1 megabyte cache memory, it just said right back. Um, I think that's something the M919 board does too when it has like the fake cache. But uh, I had to track down a bad L2 cache module and I had a few extra so I swapped it out and uh, now it seems to be working just fine. And here we go, the updated results. Um, I ran the benchmarks with both 32 and 64 megabytes of RAM. I thought maybe it would make a difference, uh, but they both scored exactly the same. So, uh, either way, with the amount of RAM, we scored the same with 1 megabyte of L2 cache. And I was a little surprised it was a little bit faster. Now, when I say a little bit, I mean a little bit. Uh, we're talking 1 uh, mark or point or FPS or less. Um, so, tiny, tiny difference. Um, probably not noticeable, but things did seem to run ever so slightly faster upgrading to 256 to 1 megabyte. It's, it's kind of what I expected. I, I, I thought maybe there would even be a chance of it running slower, because again, I've heard um, it, it could run slower if you have like a large amount of, of uh, L2 cache, and if the balance between it and the RAM is off, I don't know. But in this case, um, it did end up being ever so slightly faster. Not worth the effort, in my opinion. I, you know, 256 still seems to be the best bang for your buck, but uh, it did seem to give a very slight speed increase across the board here in these tests. All right, so I think we've got all the setting up and all the benchmark out of the way. So let's finally get to actually playing some games on this and uh, seeing how well it plays games. So first look at uh, Duke Nukem 3D. Uh, I'm just running it with the Sound Blaster Pro. Um, and 
I, I want to. I'm going to directly compare it again to LGR's Woodgrain 46. At least his first incarnation that had a uh, DX266 megahertz. And again, I'm just doing that because it makes a good comparison. And, and most people that watch this channel are probably familiar with him and that specific video and the Woodgrain 46. And um, again, Duke Nukem 3D. I think it's from '97. It's it's not a game I would play on a 46. I'd play it on something a little faster. Um, but I know even after he added cash on his machine, it ran not smooth, which was kind of expected. Um, I was sort of impressed with this machine. It didn't run it smooth, but it was, uh, it seemed to run smoother. Uh, I'm running at, you know, the same, uh, resolution, uh, but I'm keeping, I'm not, like, lowering the screen, um, size itself, or the viewable area, um, or anything like that, and it just, it, it seemed like it kind of had a hiccup at first, uh, but then it kind of smoothed out, and I was, I was actually pretty impressed how this ran on, uh, my 66 megahertz DX2, uh, especially when comparing it, so, I don't know, what do you guys think? So running with the built-in FPS counter on here, it was still it was kind of impressive, quite playable. Again, I didn't reduce the viewing area. This is still on high detail. Um, we're not using like the higher uh, SVGA resolutions, um, but this is still quite playable. Uh, I rarely went below, say, 15 FPS, and it would reach 30 at points. So uh, definitely playable, not buttery smooth. I mean, if I was to play this game, this is more of like, this is a lot late DOS era game. I would definitely play this probably on like a Pentium of some sort, but um, I, I still say it's quite playable on this, uh, this specific 486. <laughs> So throughout showing some of these games, um, I'm going to kind of compare and contrast a little bit. Uh, of course, I have the Sound Blaster Pro 2.0, but I have also hooked up my MT32 through the Roland interface card. Um, it's a little bit of a, well, it's a little bit messy setup. You know, it goes down here to the keyboard, and I've got the um, what the M the MPU unit here, and the MIDI box is connected right here, and then this is going down. So the computer on the floor right now and it's connected and then this is the audio cable that's going into the sound blaster it's a bit of a mess but right now it's just I'm just testing basically um, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you during the video what sound if we're using the sound blaster or if we're using the MT32 um, I'll probably put a little um, if I don't say I'll put a little title or something like that to indicate uh, what we're doing for sound and of course with this setup we're not just limited to using the MT32 I have an SC55 right next to it, and you could use any number of different, uh, you know, MIDI sound modules uh, with the uh, MIDI card.
In the Age of Chaos, two factions battled for dominance. The Kingdom of Azeroth was a prosperous one. The humans who dwelled there turned the land into a paradise. The Knights of Stormwind and the clerics of Norsha Abbey roamed far and wide, serving the king's people with honor and justice. The well-trained armies of the king maintained a lasting peace for many generations. Yes? Yes, my lord. Your command? There are enemies nearby. We are under yes, attack! Yes, my lord. Your bidding? Yes, my lord. Uh, so what we're looking at here, this is the VGA remake of Quest for Glory, the first one. Now, I've beaten the original EGA version. I haven't beaten this VGA version. I'd like to eventually, but I don't know. I just wanted... I don't know. I just... I think I prefer the look of the EGA version. I mean, I technically, yes, this VGA version is superior. Technically, there's more colors. Uh, it looks more realistic, I guess. But I don't know, it's just something special about the EGA version of not just this game, but many games. But even this scene here, like the magic shop over on the right hand corner, like that eyeball, like in the EGA corner, it was a lot more animated. It was like this eye and there was flames coming up behind it. I don't know, it just, it looks really dull and, and drab in this VGA uh, remake. Now I guess you could argue that like it's not VGA's fault, like they could have done that in VGA and they could have made it look really good and spectacular, but they chose not to for whatever reason, but I don't know. Personally, I, I just like the art style of EGA.
So this is Utopia, the creation of a nation from 1991 on MS-DOS. And um, this is, well, I don't know if it's an interesting game. It's, I, I haven't really played the DOS version, That's why, and it's been a long time since I played any version, so that's why you just kind of see me not looking like I'm not really knowing what I'm doing here. But um, I first encountered this game on the Super Nintendo, and I actually rented it um, from a grocery store. So we had a local grocery store, and back, back in the 90s, even places like grocery stores usually had video game and movie rentals and I rented it on Super Nintendo and I, it was I was a Sim City fan and um, so this game was I thought it was gonna be similar and it, it is similar um, but I didn't really like it at first and then when I got the hang of it um, I kinda started liking it and there was some like weird Star Trek references and, and stuff like that and it's it just takes some getting used to um, I plan to play this version one day like actually sit down and actually play it uh, but it's kind of like uh, I mean, it's not, you're not just building a city, you also have to, like, defend it from aliens, so you, like, build defenses and tanks and, and spaceships and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it seems to play pretty decent on this, uh, 66 megahertz DX2. Maybe even a little fast, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I was able to play it fine, but if you look at some of the buildings, the lights are flickering. It looks to me kind of fast, um... Or like the little radar thing spinning around real fast. But I don't know, maybe that's how the game is supposed to run. I don't really have anything to compare it to. Um, but, it, I mean, it played fine. Uh, except for maybe those animations moving a little fast. If they even are. Um, so yeah, Utopia. The creation of a nation. <laughs> a very, um, I don't know, not a very well-known game. I don't think so. I never hear anyone talking about it. But it's it's a little bit special to me. This is Eye of the Beholder Part 3. This is the last in the Eye of the Beholder, uh, like, first-person dungeon crawler RPG series. Uh, I haven't beaten this one yet. Um, it's notoriously, like, not as good as 1 and 2. It's actually notoriously kind of bad and overly difficult. And, um, yeah, this is just the beginning intro. Look at this guy. He comes in to give you, like, a quest. Like, look at he He's immediately evil. Like, look at his shifty eyes. And you immediately know this guy is is a bad guy, and you shouldn't trust him. <laughs> it's like and look at his his fingernails. Like what he like if I was in the group, like look at his fingernails. Like okay, guys, yeah, this guy's evil. He's going to uh, trick us, and uh, you know, I I don't know. I haven't played the game through, so maybe he isn't evil. Uh, but man, look at those shifty eyes and those fingernails. Um, but yeah, this is the last game I think we're gonna look at here. I I tried to get the gambit of like um, you know shooters and first person shooters and simulation and now an RPG so um, yeah hope you enjoyed the uh, video I do have a wrap-up after this so uh, stay tuned to hear my, my final comments on this build <laughs>
So as I was wrapping up this video, I actually had a friend uh, give me one of these HDD clickers. So here it is. Uh, here's the wire that comes with it. It has a little Molex connector. I guess it just needs power to run the piezo speaker there. And then there's a couple. I don't know. It looks like you could put jumpers there. Um, I'm assuming this knows when the hard drive is being, uh, being used by the signal from the HDD LED light. So I'm assuming... Um, you know, it goes from the front of the case to here, and then here to the card, or something like that. I don't know what this little power uh, thing is right here. Um, but I'll try setting it up, and we'll see how it works and how it sounds. Alright, so here it is right here. I don't really have a place to mount it, so it's just, it's pretty light. It's just kind of hanging there. I did have one free uh, Molex connector, thank goodness, that uh, I can connect on there, so I don't have to use any kind of, like, janky splitters or anything. So... Uh, we'll see. I have the, you know, the cable coming out of here, and then I have the case uh, HDD um, LED connected to it. Don't know if the orientation's right or not, or so uh, I guess we'll have to hook it up and find out. All right, so let's see if it uh, makes any noise here. I don't suspect it will sound very much like a hard drive at all, but it's something. I can see where... Um, you know, it's not going to do the, the spinning up sound or anything like that, like a hard drive, but I can see how oh, it's a good good indication uh, if your hard drive's seeking or doing something rather than, you know, so you're not always level with the light here to check, so. Seems to be an easy way to check. Oh. Well, it's... Hmm. Well, it seems that it's clicking, but my light's not working now. Um, so, let me, hold on, it DOS is, uh, it's doing the high mem testing for extended memory, so it should start doing a lot of clicking in a moment, and I can double check. Yeah, I don't see the light there, so, it just looks like an orientation thing, so, um, let me play around with the wires. Okay, yeah, it was just a simple orientation of the wires that I had wrong, but it seems to be functioning now. There it is right there. It's got a little green light. It it actually sounds a little bit better than I was suspecting. It's not as like loud and chirpy as I was expecting. It, it I mean it doesn't it doesn't sound like a hard drive seeking. Like and if it did, it would be like maybe a really old one. Um uh, but I don't know. I I kind of like it. Yeah, I think I'll keep it in there. Um, it, it's something, so not perfect, but um, it's something. Uh, unless, you know, you might like the eerie silence that just having a compact flash card um, gives you. You know, I have it in my Tandy there, and it's it's that thing it doesn't have a fan. That thing is dead silent, and, you know, there's pluses and minuses to it. Um, it's, it's like you wouldn't even know if that thing is on, um, but I, I don't know. Sometimes I kind of like the reassuring click that something's happening there, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with it, I'm definitely, I think I'm going to leave it in here, and I think maybe with the case over it, it'll be even a little bit more muted, but, so, uh, I don't know, maybe it'll sound a little more like a hard drive, but, but, uh, yeah, pretty good. Alright, so what are my feelings, uh, on this machine right here, am I happy with it, and I've got to say, yes, I'm actually really pleased with the end results. Um, I was expecting more issues with the whole right back cache uh, and, and things like that, but like, it's been smooth. Uh, <laughs> it's been one of the smoother builds I have put together. Um, other than some weirdness, like, like programs like Cache Check not working right, it seems to be working okay. And, and I did have some initial issues getting the Soundbraster Pro 2 working. Uh, I don't know, that might have been the card I tried at first. Uh, but everything seems to be working just great now. Uh, it's been very stable. I haven't had any, like, crashes or, or weird errors or anything like that with it. It's just, it has worked beautifully. Uh, with the benchmarks and tested, it does seem to be faster than my old 46. And uh, I'm just really happy with it. You know, it lacks some things. It doesn't have, like, an internal zip drive um, that I can use. But I can always hook up an external one if I need to do that. And, uh, yeah, I just, I really like it. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just pleased with it. Uh, so, yeah, this guy will be my new, uh, flagship 486, um, at least as far as that mid-range 66 megahertz goes. So, 
Uh, do you guys have any comments or suggestions? I'd be very eager to hear them. Uh, what do you think about this build? How does it compare? Um, for... I, I, you might be questioning, like, should you put together a build like this? A uh, right-back enhanced build. You know, I'd say, you know, if, you're, if you just want a retro computer and you want a 46, and maybe you're just getting into the hobby, just, there is no shame in just using a standard BOG DX2 uh, 46. It is a great CPU, whether you're doing right through or right back. Uh, don't let that deter you. Don't get caught up in, if you watch this video and you want to make a build, don't get caught up in the like, oh, I've got to have the highest end stuff and I've got to have it right back and I've got to have one meg of L2 cache and 64 megabytes of RAM. It's really not necessary for the majority of games. It's, it's really not necessary. Um, you know, someone like me that's, that's built so many builds and is just looking for something a little bit different, this was a fun build. And I think I'm going to have fun using this machine. Um, but it's, it's not necessary. Don't feel bad if, you know, what you can obtain is just a regular old uh, 46. And, you know, uh, my original 46 uh, that I gamed on, like we, that I showed you earlier, uh, it just had a regular DX2, 66 megahertz. For years, I just had like a Trident VLB card. I think I had like 8 megabytes of RAM. It was nothing super special, and it served me very well. So don't, don't feel bad about that. But if you want to put together something like this, go ahead. It is a fun project. And the CPUs aren't too hard to find uh, with the right back. And as we saw, it didn't give me a whole lot of trouble. So again, if you have any comments or questions, put them in the uh, comments down below. And uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.